Well, it occurs to me that if we truly are prepared to take on the immense challenges of the 21st century, then I believe we've no choice but to enlist and embrace the equally immense power of the most recent digital technologies. And to do so in a way that makes the present rate of progress look exactly what it is, pitifully inadequate. Let's face it, in many respects, life beyond the school gates across many parts of the world has been transformed in the past 20 years or so. Digital technology, whether it's mobiles, the internet or video games, has fundamentally reshaped the way in which children and young people connect with, make sense of and engage with society. Rightly or wrongly, young people expect an entirely new form of relationship with the world around them, one that doesn't simply rely on accessing information, but on creating new knowledge, new products and new resources. Let me be crystal clear. None of these developments negate the fundamental need to focus on the reading, writing and mathematical skills which remain at the heart of being able to present oneself as a functioning and informed citizen in an increasingly competitive globalised society. But we have to take on board some fundamental truths about the way in which the expectations of young people have changed if we're to deliver learning that engages and remains fit for purpose over the coming decades. Let me offer an example from the sphere in which I spent the bulk of my professional life, the world of moving images. Children and young people have become ever more familiar with the customising and sharing of information and moving images of every kind in order to produce their own creative content. That's just one reason why 15 hours of video, both professional and user-generated, are uploaded onto YouTube every single minute. And there's been a 50% increase in the rate at which content's been uploaded in the last 12 months alone, with every sign that this is only going to grow exponentially. Let me offer you another example, this time from gaming via Little Big Planet, which Sony is now backing for education in the US in a very big way. This game is much less about traditional game playing and much more about content creation. The US competition seeks to use Little Big Planet as the platform of creation and sharing of new learning resources, not just as a jet games playing, as not just a games playing platform. This is a major step forward in games design. In fact, it's barely a game at all. Yet its huge popularity has, in effect, launched the PS3 for Sony. And what these examples help underline is that young people in particular are surrounded by a veritable plethora of moving images of every kind. And while they may be extremely competent technically, somewhat more technically competent than I suspect many of us, there are very considerable challenges around helping them to sort the wheat from the chaff, the good from the bad, the valuable from the useless. Helping them understand the ways in which moving images increasingly shape or can distort the world around us. Only by engaging with these new and at times quite intimidating challenges to the process of teaching and learning, almost all of which are facilitated by digital technology, will we produce a generation of creative learners with a breadth and a depth of understanding capable of dealing with this new and incredibly difficult century of ours. Actually, it's theirs. Understanding literacy as a term which incorporates a fluid understanding of the moving image as well as the written word, allows teachers to promote an extended awareness of narrative and to explore meaning, some of which can be derived only from an audiovisual medium. What's pretty clear is that YouTube and other similar services are hardly likely to deliver that type of understanding unaided. If you don't believe me, just look at the user comments beneath a random sample of content, professional and self-generated, and the level of prejudice and almost willful ignorance that's on display. All too often, only the very loudest voices seem to drown out the possibility of a thoughtful response. So surely we need to create learning environments in which informed responses to the challenges of the 21st century are encouraged and nurtured. This would be a world in which prejudice and ignorance could be far better understood for exactly what they are. In my judgment, we need to take a deep collective breath and accept the increasing centrality of the moving image at the heart of learning and the very serious opportunities that offers. We also need to recognise that this is no longer simply about the power of narratives absorbed at the cinema or on television, but also the power of image-supported interacted information that's downloaded on Xboxes, iPhones, netbooks and so on. In fact, on every conceivable and convenient device possible. In the UK, 
There are now plenty of schools working with organisations like Future Lab, which I have the privilege of chairing, to develop classroom practices and new approaches to curriculum design, which are underpinned by the aim of supporting kids to become informed and literate digital participants. Initiatives are being developed within schools that twin the application of new media for learning with fresh thinking about the curriculum and teaching practices. For example, by conducting historical inquiry via online archives, by interpreting and producing literary hypertext, by testing and constructing science simulations. This challenges what we teach, as well as how it's taught, let alone why it's taught. Let me offer an example of what I mean in relation to both the opportunities and the challenges by looking through the prism of an issue that affects every single person in this room this morning, no matter where you're from, and that's namely climate change. As the former chair of the UK Parliament's committee which scrutinised the Climate Change Bill, it's crystal clear to me that the challenges we face require that at the very minimum we've no serious alternative but to rethink our lifestyles and find new and better ways to reduce our individual consumption of energy, to unquestioningly embrace what we might begin to call sustainable consumption. But when I use the term sustainable, I mean not only recalibrating our buying habits, but also gaining broad acceptance for the idea of a more responsible approach to the consumption of goods. As the biologist Marlon Hoagland once put it, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. But then most of our mothers had told us that before we left infant school. The talks in Copenhagen, starting in just the next few days, are just one of the first pieces in a very complex political framework that's likely to be required if to achieve our aim of a sustainable society and a sustainable planet. The full implications of climate change will, over time, ask a great deal of every citizen in every country represented here this morning, but most especially of those children and young people who are now in full-time education. And this is where education and learning in a digital context can have a huge role to play. For me, the absolute precondition to digging ourselves out of the quite incredible mess we find ourselves in lies with the encouragement of a far smarter and better informed global society. A global society that's able quite unambiguously to understand and appreciate the consequences of each and every one of its actions, whether they're personal, economic, or environmental. And any intelligent response to this challenge must inevitably include the development of an ever greater layering and depth to every type of information gathering. In other words, exactly the kind of activity that interactive digital media, games for example, do extraordinarily well. As a consequence, I can easily envisage a time when what we currently describe as interactive games offer access to far more substantive forms of learning through easily navigated links than we've ever previously thought to be possible. Now, why do I believe this? Well, let me offer the example from the lessons we're beginning to learn from a climate change simulation game that's being developed in the UK. What's been fascinating to me, but maybe rather less surprising to you, is that the very first thing kids do when they get hold of these games is destroy the planet. Now, only when they've done that a couple of times and looked at the repercussions do they go back, maybe the third or fourth time around, and begin to look at the issues involved in building an infinitely more sustainable model. In many respects, this is little short of a revolution in the way that we learn. For a start, it's a lot less didactic, because instead of saying to kids, this is the way to do it, what you're in effect saying is, here are the tools and here are your options. It's the equivalent, if you like, of learning to use a flight simulator. You take off, you keep it in the air, and you land it safely in the right place. And you don't even need to tell them that that's what they're supposed to do. An assessment is self-evident. Safe flight and landing represent success, crash, and you've failed. Kids can tell you whether they've succeeded or not, and if they failed, their most likely response is to immediately want to try again and again and again until they succeed. In real life, that's exactly how we all learn. In fact, that's how people have always learned. But oddly, and this is purely my own observation, that type of thinking seems never to have quite transmitted itself to the established world of teaching and learning. 